Good evening, everyone. As principal, it is my happy duty to introduce this inaugural lecture, Why Do Academics Publish? Brackets, the way that they do, to be delivered by Professor Aileen Fyth of the School of History. Today's inaugural lecture is necessarily online. In the same pandemic context, we are unable to host our conventional drinks reception after the event, but this lecture format has the advantage nonetheless of enabling staff and students to join us from a variety of locations. In keeping with our traditions, following this introduction, Professor Fife will deliver her inaugural lecture and today's event will conclude with a vote of thanks from the Dean of Arts, Professor Frank Lorenz Muller. Aileen attained a first class Master of Arts degree in Natural Sciences from Jesus College, University of Cambridge, followed by an MPhil and a PhD there in the History and Philosophy of Science. After completing her doctoral studies in the year 2000, Aileen moved to the History Department at the Nat National University of Ireland, Galway, where she worked first as a junior lecturer, then as a college lecturer in the History of Science from 2004 to 2010. In 2011, Aileen relocated once again, this time here to the University of St Andrews, where she was appointed lecturer in modern British history. And I'm very pleased that Aileen has remained with us since, being promoted to reader in 2013 and professor of modern history in 2017, an achievement we celebrate today. I have much valued my discussions over the past few years with Aileen on many subjects, but particularly our shared research interest in book history. So it is with particular pleasure that I introduce today's lecture and celebrate the breadth of Aileen's achievements. Aileen's research focuses on the history of technology and science and the ways in which science is communicated, subjects she has explored in two single author books, Science and Salvation, Evangelicals and Popular Science Publishing in Victorian Britain, published in 2004, and Steam-Powered Knowledge, William Chambers and the Business of Publishing, 1820 to 1860, published in 2012. Both books were published with the University of Chicago Press and Steam-Powered Knowledge won both the Edelstein Prize from the Society for the History of Technology and the Colby Prize from the Research Society for Victorian Periodicals. Aileen has co-edited three further books and several journal special issues and is currently co-editing with Professor Colin Kidd a volume entitled After the Enlightenment, Currents and Controversies in Scottish Intellectual Life 1790 to 1914, based upon a research project for which they were awarded a Levy Hume Trust project grant of over £430,000. Aileen has an extraordinary history of grant success, which signifies the national recognition of her skills and authority and, of course, the value of her research. Just three years after entering the Academy, Aileen received a grant from the Irish Research Council for Humanities and Social Sciences of over €117,000, followed by a Government of Ireland Fellowship in 2004 worth €38,000. Most significantly, in 2013, Aileen was awarded £790,000 from the Arts and Humanities Research Council for her project, Publishing the Philosophical Transactions, the findings of which are being prepared for publication as the History of Scientific Journals, Royal Society Publishing, 1665, uh, 1665 to 2015, co-authored with colleagues at the university and just delivered to its publisher last month. These projects and publications are just the most significant examples of an extensive research career, comprising many journal articles, book chapters, conference papers, and invited academic lectures at universities across the world, from Canada to Sweden. But what is also key about Aileen's career is that she has combined a publication with extensive and terrific public engagement through many media and in many forms. 
In connecting academic and public discourse, science in general and open knowledge, Aileen really does practice what she preaches. Throughout her time at St Andrews, Aileen has been an engaged member of our university community and I would like in particular to highlight two publications, Academic Women Now, released in 2016 in partnership with the Young Academy of Scotland, of which Aileen has also served as co-chair, and Academic Women Here, released in 2017 in partnership with the University of St Andrews both of which were compiled and co-written with her St Andrews-based colleagues, Professor Sharon Ashbrook and Professor Inika de Myrtle. These publications and the larger projects of which they were a part examined the career progression of women in academia in order to foster greater gender diversity at senior levels. And they have made a lasting contribution to the way we think about gender in Scottish higher education. Aileen furthers this work by serving on the university's gender pay working group alongside other responsibilities. She has served as director of postgraduate studies and is currently director of research for the School of History. She has been a member of the Open Research Working Group since 2016 and the University Research Committee since 2018 and she was last year appointed to the museum's academic advisory committee. Also an admired tutor and lecturer teaching at all levels of study, Aileen's contributions to our university are many, multifaceted and always with the best intentions of the students and colleagues in her school and across the university in mind. Her inquiring mind and her aptitude for challenge and reconsideration have the capacity to move both her subjects and her institution along. We are fortunate indeed that Aileen is a part of our academic family and it is now a great pleasure to welcome Professor Aileen Fife to deliver her inaugural lecture, Why Do Academics Publish the Way That They Do? Aileen. Thank you, Principal. And welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us from wherever in the world you have come tonight. I want to start by taking us back to something that happened in 2015 when the Royal Society of London was celebrating its role in the history of scientific publishing. Because 350 years before that, a man called Henry Oldenburg, who was the very first secretary of the Royal Society, had founded a periodical devoted to natural knowledge, and it was called the Philosophical Society. And I've spent the last seven years of my career studying that history of the transaction. It is the world's longest running scientific periodical, and indeed the longest running academic journal of any sort. And its history provides us with a window through which we can study the many changes in academic publishing over the last three and a half centuries. In 2015, at a conference that was very much about the future of scholarly scientific communication, the then president of the Royal Society, Sir Paul Nurse, explained why he believed 1665 had been quite so important. He described it as a truly seminal development. And in his description of this, we can see some answers to the initial part of my question, why do academics publish? Because Sir Paul laid out some of the reasons why being in a scientific journal might be useful for a scientific researcher, to communicate and share your ideas, to establish your priority claims, and he said, most importantly, to expose your work to your peers for assessment and scrutiny. And a little bit later on, he also mentioned another purpose, to record and archive knowledge for the future. So this is a list of some of the reasons why academics might publish in scholarly journals, but I'd suggest that it's a rather limited and partial list that doesn't really get at the heart of why academics publish, let alone why they do it in the ways that they do. But before I leave Sir Paul, uh, I want to draw your attention to the end part of his comments, where he remarked that transactions had established fundamental principles that were still in use by journals today, and that science publishing has remained almost unchanged from then until a few decades ago. Now this sort of historical narrative can provide uh, comfort and reassurance to the modern scientific community that apparently they're still working in pretty much the same ways as, shall we say, um, Isaac Newton did back in the 17th century. The problem is that it's simply not true because scientific publishing certainly has changed in a whole variety of ways since 1665. 
One of those reasons is very much to do with the fact that the context of scholarly work of research has changed since then. That matters because if you were to ask academics now, why do you publish? As for instance, some of my colleagues in sociology do ask these kinds of questions. You would get answers that are very much about the development of academic careers. You'll get answers about how important it is to gain reputation and prestige through publishing and how important it is to one's job prospects, one's promotion prospects, one's professorship prospects, of course. So academic publishing now plays this very important role within a very particular professional context, that of the academic community. But it was not always so. If we went back to the medieval period to when this university was founded, research and publishing were not core elements of its activities. Back then, the main role of the professors and masters was to teach, and it remained so for centuries thereafter. And of course, it is still an important part of our role in the university today. But where does research come into things? If we look at when the Transactions was founded in the late 17th century, it is true that there were some professors among its readers, but its main audience was a different group. We might call them gentleman scholars, who had an interest in the then new experimental approaches to natural knowledge. I'm thinking about the sort of gentleman who founded the Royal Society. The point here is that scholarship, if you would, you can barely call it research at this point, but certainly curiosity and inquiry about the natural world tended to happen outside the universities, though perhaps with university training, but not in those spaces. But things changed as we move into the 19th century, when old universities were reformed, when new universities were established, when a lot more academic jobs were created, and when we start to see the beginnings of a professional career path emerging. So in the modern research university, publishing, and more specifically a particular form of publishing, has come to be seen as crucial academic careers. Now I should point out that not everything academics publish is, of course, what we might call academic publishing because here's a selection of the things that I myself have published recently. This is only the ones that are in print in some format. And not all of those would we call academic publishing, though they're all by an academic. So if we try to think about what is it about some of these publications, particularly um, these ones, that count as academic publishing, then we're thinking about things like the intended audience for these publications, the fact that most of these are intended for more specialist expert audiences by colleagues in different disciplines. Another implication is of it being academic is that these tend to be um, more access, sorry, more ex expensive in the way in which they are produced. If you wanted to buy access to one of these journal articles, actually not the one that's in the middle right now because it's open access, but some of the other ones, you're looking at $35 for a relatively short article. Um, many books, although frankly not actually steam powered knowledge, are priced at prices that are rather difficult for individuals to afford. There's a particular economic model behind academic publishing that's geared towards institutional sales rather than sales to individual consumers. But the big thing that makes academic publishing different is the question of the, sorry, the um, way in which it, all the publications receive editorial scrutiny ahead of time. They have been peer reviewed. It's that thing about peer review which is generally seen as a defining feature of academic publishing. And in the 20th century, peer review came to be seen as central to our trust in science. Peer review was held up as a thing that, made, under, that enables us to make sense of science, that enables the public or our politicians and our governments to trust science, indeed to follow the science. We're still doing that these days. It's the fact that scientific research goes through that process of expert scrutiny ahead of publication that reassures us that there have been efforts made to check up on outlandish ideas or to try to catch mistakes in methods or in logic or in interpretation. And that process of scrutiny by other experts who are supposed to know what they're talking about offers an answer to why scientific research can be trusted more than opinion or online gossip, as we have seen in recent months. But something else that the recent experience shows us is that there are some disadvantages to peer review. It does, for instance, undoubtedly slow down the process of publication. And when we're in the midst of trying to seek palliatives, let alone vaccines for coronavirus, then speed seems rather urgent. We can see reliable news outlets now reporting from preliminary research results, admitting that this has not yet been peer reviewed or published in a journal. 
And this has led to an increase in the debate about whether the current academic publishing system is fit for purpose, is the best and most efficient way of doing things. Would there be another way that would enable academic research to develop faster, particularly in current climate? This just adds to a whole set of existing concerns about the processes of peer review when there are already people worrying about whether it does in fact catch errors, does it, catch, does it actually catch frauds, can it do these things, and more particularly, does it show biases against certain underrepresented groups within research, gender biases in particular, but not only. So there are a lot of questions around peer review and whether we should continue to use it or whether we should continue to use it in this way. So that's part of what I'm asking today. Why do academics publish in this way? But it's not just a question about peer review. The pandemic has also drawn more attention to those questions that others have been asking about the commercial model underpinning academic publishing and whether it's broken. There's been a lot of scrutiny, basically since the internet arrived, of, uh, about the huge profits that some publishing companies have been making from research that is largely publicly or charitably funded, but is not easily accessible to all the people who might actually need or want to read it. Again, in the current crisis, it seems highly desirable that there would be freer, easier and faster access to research for everybody who might need access, not just those in the affluent academic institutions of the global north. We need policymakers, we need politicians, governments and similar organisations to have access to this research, as well as research around the world so you can build on this. And so we saw various publishers, including Elsevier that I have up here, deciding during the pandemic to give access, free access to their, some of their journal contents, as incidentally they had done during the Ebola crisis as well. But note that the very fact that it's seen as necessary to open up the results of scientific research in a special way because of the pandemic seems to me an implicit acceptance that the usual model of publishing isn't quite working, or as um, the head of Open Research Welcome recently commented, that the traditional publishing models are not fit for purpose. So these are some of the issues why it really matters to think about why academics publish in these ways, with this particular form of editorial scrutiny and within this economic model. I know there are other features of academic publishing as well, but it'll be those two that I want to focus on today. Um, I will, however, just say a little bit about how I came to study these topics before I tell you um, some answers to those questions. So that's where I'm going to be going for the next little while. There are, I hope, some of you in this virtual room who will remember me at an earlier stage in my academic career and will know that I certainly did not set out to study academic publishing. My early research interests were very much in the popularisation of science. I wanted to investigate how people who were not themselves part of the scientific community would gain their understanding of the natural world. And I put up this picture to remind some of you of the enormous fun that we had in exploring some of those questions. But it was by investigating the way that science was presented in places as varied as children's books, as museums, tourist guidebooks, and religious tracts that I became very interested in the processes of authorship and editing. In other words, who gets to write and revise and select the knowledge that gets presented to the public, but also questions about production and circulation, things like price and format, and how that knowledge actually gets to anybody. How could people get access to it? And I think you'll see there's a clear legacy of those concerns in my current work today. Now, my change of direction came about in this building in the centre of London in 2012, when I was attending an editorial board meeting in the Royal Society. And there was some discussion back then about how the Royal Society could celebrate the upcoming 350th anniversary of philosophical transactions. And we realised that although scholars had already written quite a bit about the origin moment in 1665, we actually knew remarkably little about what happened next, about the rest of the 350 years. To cut a long story short, the outcome is that I end up leading a research team to investigate the full 350 year history of Royal Society journal publishing. I just want to pause there to say to those of you who are maybe not familiar with modern history, to point out how unusual that 350 year time span actually is. We often work in modern history in time spans of a few decades, perhaps part of a century, but 350 years is pretty unusual. And I have to say, when I started off, it seemed really rather daunting. And so this is, I think, the appropriate moment to acknowledge the people who helped me on that journey. The AHRC, who funded Noah and Julie and Camilla to work as postdoctoral researchers on that project, whose expertise was invaluable to me. 
but also Keith and Stuart at the Royal Society who gave me access, gave us all access to resources, who encouraged and supported us, and who also asked awkward questions that made us go back to the archives and look again at things. Thank you to you all for coming on this journey with me and for helping me to explore the history of academic publishing. Our purpose in this project was not to study the things that were ultimately published in the transactions, but to look behind the scenes, to look in the archive. And the Royal Society being the kind of institution that it is, it has very good archives, which made this project so much easier or possibly more difficult because there was so much stuff to look at. You could look at it either way. The sorts of materials I'm talking about range from private correspondence through to committee reports on circulation figures, through to editorial registers, a record for every paper that was submitted and its editorial outcome, through to bundles upon bundles upon bundles of referee reports. From studying these kinds of records, we can say that the history of academic publishing has certainly changed since 1665 in format, in style, and in management. Scientific journals don't work the same way that they did in 1665. And in fact, when we look more closely, a lot of the features that we associate with a modern scientific or academic journal, including things like research, should be original. It should be written by the people who actually did the research. It should go through refereeing or peer review processes. It should have some kind of standardised style and structure. These things all happened in the 19th century, not the 17th century. As for big profits, the use of English as the international language of science, the emergence of uh, professional managing editors in journal publishing, these are 20th century phenomena. And as I've already mentioned, the assumption that peer review is essential to the publication of research is very much a product of the late 20th century. So that is one outline of the history of academic publishing. I would mention a couple of other things before I go into my specific questions. One is to note that from the 1660s right through till the 1950s, the production and circulation of research journals, specifically research journals, was dominated by learned institutions of various sorts. Learned societies, academies, subject associations, they have various types, but scholarly institutions of some sort. I will be referring to them as learned societies for the rest of what I'm saying, but I mean these sorts of organisations, whatever title they happen to carry. That dominance began with transactions in the 1660s, but other national academies and similar bodies of the late 17th century also had their periodicals featuring the research of their members and those of their network. And as those types of academies expanded and grew across the 18th century, crossing Europe from Sweden and then ultimately the rest of the world, Argentina, South Africa in the 19th century, more of these organisations means more journals for these organisations. And particularly in the 19th century, we see a specialisation taking place that we don't just have one national academy, but we have lots of specialist societies for chemistry, for zoology, for microscopy, for history, for geology. And all of these have journals as well. So we're seeing an expansion in the numbers of scientific journals during the 18th and 19th centuries. But these ones are all still associated with some form of learned institution. It's not to say that there weren't other sorts of scientific periodicals, the independent of institutions, there certainly were. Um, it's been estimated there were about a thousand of them in the 18th century, but they tended to be incredibly short lived, maybe just a year or two, sometimes not even that long. Because, you know, there's something quite important about having the backing of an institution of some sort. That could most obviously be money, but there's also value in the human resources and networks that an institution can offer and the hope of reputation, authority, credibility that it can bring. Without such a backing, it was much more difficult to make a success out of a periodical. And it wasn't until the late 18th century that we start to see some independent journals that did actually manage to survive long term, initially in the German lands, but also in Britain and the English speaking lands thereafter. Nature might be the most famous of those, but it certainly wasn't first. These journals were different from the ones associated with learned institutions in two key ways. One was the fact they didn't have an institution behind them, rather they were run very much by their editor who were in charge of what appeared in them and what direction they took. But the other difference was that they carried different sorts of content at this point in time. These journals tended to carry stuff that the editors thought customers might actually pay for. It tended to be more miscellaneous and newsy than you would get in the transactions or memoir of the learned institutions. Here we're looking at things like reports of meetings, we're looking at book reviews, we might have letters to the editor, we might have some controversy even 
there would be quite likely some short original research reports, but that was not their main purpose. I mean, the research journals were the ones published by the learned institutions. Both sorts of periodicals continued to grow in numbers through the late 19th and into the 20th century. By the time we get to the 1960s, there were complaints in the pages of nature, but how many more new journals can there possibly be? And we also start to see academic attempts to graph the history of this with this is a the famous example from 1961, that it seemed to be such a phenomenon that there were more and more journals. What does this say about the state of science in the 1960s? In this is a period when more universities were expanding, being founded, doing more research as part of an academic job description. But it's also a time when governments in Britain and North America throughout Europe were starting to put more money into scientific research. In other words, there was more research being done and thus more journals needed to publish it in. And it's in this mid 20th century period that the learned institutions began to lose their dominance of the publication of research journals. To a certain extent, that was because some of the older players started to become more prominent in the publication of original research. But especially it was about the emergence of new players in research, new publishing firms that appeared after the Second World, World War and moved into the publication of research journals, of which Pergamon Press is the most notable example, but also some of its Dutch equivalents, all of which are now bound together in the firm known as Relics Elsevier. And it's from this point on that commercial journals became increasingly major players in the publication of research. Nowadays, of course, there's a whole range of different organisations publishing academic research, both in learned institutions and commercial publishers. But studies by bibliographers have worked out that um, just a handful of the big publishers are actually responsible for a vast amount of the output and particularly that big international media conglomerates have what has been called by others an oligopoly over academic publishing. So that is the structure within which the, my comments on peer review and the business model must be framed. So let me now turn to look at the question of peer review and why this has become such an important part of academic publishing. I should say that by peer review, we're talking about the process by which experts, peers, of the author, people who know about the same topic as the author, are asked to read and report on research, usually though not necessarily ahead of publication. Um, it usually also involves making suggestions to the author about how to improve their work. So it's not merely a process of publish or don't publish, it also has that role in improving what is published. Now peer review is often assumed to have been around as long as scientific journals. We quotes such as this one from a parliamentary report in 2010 saying that peer review has always been regarded as crucial to the reputation and reliability of scientific research. Again that's part of that comforting narrative that this is how things have always worked, don't worry it's supposed to be like this, of course it should keep being like this. This claim is trivially easy to debunk in a terminological sense because we can look for uses of the phrase peer review, we can do it Quite straightforwardly in the Google Books corpus, for instance, and you discover that until around about the mid 1960s, nobody was talking about peer review at all, and it grows in importance after that. But this how is a misleading image. I, I do like it, but it is nonetheless misleading because peer review or the process that we're talking about was around beforehand. It was just called something different. It was known as refereeing, and it had been around since the early 19th century, not noticed in 1665. But it was originally a process that was very much associated with one particular type of journal, and that is those research journals associated with learned institutions. It was only in the second half of the 20th century that it came to be adopted much more widely and to get a new name known as peer review. Now, in the Royal Society archives, there are, as I mentioned, a lot of surviving referee reports. There's over 14,000 of them in the period from 1830s to 1950, and I confess we have certainly not looked at all of them. But you can see nonetheless a really fascinating tale about how the process then known as refereeing developed. We can look at individual uh, referee reports. We can see the variation in the early years between someone like Charles Darwin, who seems to have written quite brief referee reports, to other people, including James Clark Maxwell in this instance, who wrote at rather greater length. They varied in length. There was also variation in how many referees were asked. Did you ask one expert? Did you ask two or three? Um, in the very early years, there was variation in terms of whether the different referees might write together to write a joint report or do they write independently. By the time we get to the 1860s, things are pretty much standardised on independent reports and 
usually, though not necessarily always, through referees. And we can even see that standardization further by the time we get to the 1890s when we actually get a printed form with specific questions to be answered that has survived in slightly different forms through into the 20th century. And there's a version of it now in any online editorial management system that anybody might use to write referee reports to this day. The sorts of questions that were being asked in that 1950s report included, does it contain contributions to knowledge of sufficient scientific interest? And a request also for comments or criticisms, which might enable the author to improve or correct the paper. The sorts of things that we see referees commenting on, by the way, are at this point usually any obvious errors and mistakes and misrepresentations is another one. Places where the conclusions go beyond what seem warranted by the results, and most often streamlining of prose. They really were not keen on waffly introductions, for instance. So we see an effect of this on the style of scientific writing as well as on the the quality, if you will, of what was published. So it appears that we have a standardised practice that has remained in use with minor variations till today. But I would tell you that we shouldn't take for granted that this was the way things were going to be. It wasn't obvious to everybody that this was the process that all academic publishing would start to use. For one thing, independent journal editors were not using it. Even when they started doing research a bit more, they still weren't. And nature is a classic example because, as my colleague Lindy Baldwin has pointed out, they didn't routinely send their papers to referees until 1973. But it wasn't just that. Even within the learned society world, people were pointing out that refereeing slowed things down, slowed down publication. And it was a waste of time for the referees who um, had much valuable time being practically wasted rather than doing their own research. And sometimes it even led to ill feeling. So the Henry Armstrong, 1902, I mean, he was a bit of a curmudgeonly chemist, to be honest, but um, he was describing refereeing as being an anachronism. And that was back in 1902. The concerns particularly about time didn't go away. I rather enjoyed this letter from a biochemist in 1950, who again was complaining about the time question. Please don't send me any more papers. I'm threatening to go on strike. So my point here is that it's not obvious that refereeing is a system that works well for science or for the academic community. But we should wonder why learned societies kept using it. One answer to that would be that referee was and is a way of getting expert judgment on the earth, therefore it's valuable. That's why we still use it. But I think that's not the only role that it performed. It has a number of other functions within the community that use it. Particularly enables journals to represent that community, to represent the collective voice of that community. And it also helps to define and reinforce the membership of that community. And if we take a look, closer look at the context in which refereeing was originally used, you'll see what I mean. Refereeing was originally introduced as part of a much wider set of editorial processes. And this is my attempt to give you a sense of the Royal Society's editorial processes as they were by 1900. It was not designed like this. Kind of, I thought, trust that's obvious, it had evolved over time. It began in 1752, which is when the Royal Society took formal control of the transactions and they replaced the editor with an editorial committee, which is what you see in the centre of the Committee of Papers. And over the ensuing decades, various other elements, particularly referees and then other committees, were added to it, until it became increasingly complicated. First, first thing I want to draw your attention to is the fact there's so many people involved in this. It's very different from the system where an editor decides everything. Here, there's lots of people involved. And the second thing I draw your attention to is all these people are a specific sort of people. Specifically, they're all fellows of the Royal Society. So I want to look at the implications of those two things. Why so many people? And what does it mean about in terms of insiders and outsiders? When the Royal Society took over the transactions in 1752, one of its reasons for replacing the editor with the editorial committee was a desire to have collective or corporate or institutional oversight of what appears on the pages of the transactions. The wider context is that the Royal Society was well aware that its own reputation as an institution was tightly entangled with the reputation of the transactions and what appeared in the pages. But the problem was that up until this point in time, the society had no formal or, or legal or official oversight of what appeared in the pages of the journal. There's a reputational risk there. And there's a further risk, of course, any individual editor might turn out to be incompetent or prejudiced or indeed just ill or busy. And thus that the reputation of the society might suffer through the editor not being able to pay due attention to the proper choice of material to be published. So putting a committee in charge spread the workload 
reduce the individual risk and also creates the impression of a society decision rather than an individual person's decision. And the increasing complication of editorial systems, all those extra bits added in, continues that desire to have a collective decision-making process while also adding in ways to try and make it work better, particularly by bringing in more expertise with the referees in the 1830s. Now, modern peer review functions also, I think, to give uh, this community endorsement to what is published. The referees are rep representatives of the scholarly community behind the particular journals. And they, along with the editorial committees or advisory boards, as we now have, provide a mechanism for turning a decision from something that would be that of an editor to that of a disciplinary community. Which means, I think, that although the demographics of the scientific community have changed dramatically since the 1830s, that purpose of having a collective decision still has its uses to this day. Now, let's look further at the point about the fact that they're all fellows here. There's a very closed group of people that say did share certain characteristics. Um, when, when refereeing was first introduced, mostly the fellows were commenting on each other's publications. By the time we get through to 1900, um, about 60% of papers were coming from outside the society. And thus what we have is this closed group of people, the ones you see in this picture in the 1840s, them sitting in judgment on submissions coming in from everybody else in the world who happened to send the paper to the Royal Society. So we should think about who this group of decision makers, judges, if you will, actually were. Um, I would point out that I'm not necessarily saying it is a bad thing to have a closed group of people doing the evaluation. There are definitely some advantages. These people, by dint of the fact they all belong to the same organisation, share some certain interests. The fact that they've been through the admission process meant that they had a certain level of research. Well, we call it research excellence now. Back then, they probably wouldn't say that. But nonetheless, they said they, they have a certain level of interest and achievement and expertise in their subject. They probably have a commitment to the organisation that they belong. And because they get together every Thursday evening and um, meet and discuss research and then go to the tavern afterwards, they're, they're socialised to share certain scholarly behaviours, certain ways of how one might discuss research, how one might critique research politely, need what notion of good scholarship would actually look like. So that's, those are valuable things to have, I think, in a group of people who are doing the evaluation process. But I hope you've been noticing from that picture I've got up in front of you that there is a certain lack of diversity among the fellowships of the Royal Society in the 19th century. And through, right through until 1945, they were all male. And they were also, as it happens, also mostly British, mostly white, and mostly from certain um, parts of the country. So although, in theory, papers could be submitted to the Royal Society by authors of any gender or age or nationality, they were being almost always judged and evaluated by people who were male, white, based in Britain, at least 40 years old. Maybe there's some other characteristics we can look at as well. Given what we now know about implicit bias in these kinds of systems, you know, the fact that we all tend to prefer people who are in some way a bit like us, of course we're going to expect to see bias in this system going to tend to prefer the sorts of topics that are already studied by people in this organisation, and it might be likely to prefer the sorts of people who already tend to be in this organisation. Perhaps this is most notable if we do look at gender, because by the time we get to the late 19th century, there were a small but growing number of women who were going to university, and some of them, an even smaller number, were studying the sciences. So although the first woman had published in the transaction back in 1787 and another in 1826, it was only from the late 1870s into the 1880s that we start to see a steady trickle. It is really a trickle, but we do start to see regular submissions from women. But nonetheless, the decision-making process remained entirely male-dominated until the admission of women fellows in 1945, and actually in reality it remained male-dominated for the rest of the 20th century. Now, women scientists who wanted to submit to the Royal Society faced two challenges. First, they had to get their paper into the Royal Society system, and secondly, they faced implicit biases once they had got into the system. That first point is the point about gatekeeping, because from the middle of the 18th century right through to the late 20th century, it was established practice that papers for the Society's meetings and then for its transactions could only be submitted by a fellow of the Society. They could present on behalf of someone else, um, but that meant that you had to know someone who was in the society in order to get your paper into the system. This system ensured 
that the papers being discussed at society meetings and perhaps then being published in the transactions would be not merely on the right sorts of topic, but would come from the right sorts of people. And I, I'm quite explicit about this. This was not just a process about judging the merits of research, it was also about judging the sort of person. Here is a comment at the bottom of my screen from Joseph Banks, the president of the Royal Society in the late, 19th, late 18th century, writing to another fellow explaining that it's not just that the Royal Society needed the name on the papers that were submitted to them, they didn't just need the signature, but they needed to know what sort of a person, what was this person. They wanted to make a judgment on whether this person was the right kind of person to be submitting work to the Royal Society. And this emphasis on judging people rather than just the research remained true right through until at least the early 20th century. You look at the quote at the top, this comment that the fellow who's communicating should satisfy himself the paper is fit and proper. Well, there was a huge amount of debate about what that actually meant. And right through into the 1930s, there are arguments that it, the fellow who was communicating was actually obliged to check that the quality of the paper was any good, rather than just vouching for the identity of the person who, who had authored it. Now, this system, this gatekeeping system, was exceptionally effective in keeping out unpublishable material. You see this on the exceptions rates right through in the 19th and early 20th century, about 90% of the papers submitted to the Royal Society were published, which is why you can't see much difference between the grey and the orange lines on the left hand side of this graph. And what you can see is the difference when the requirement to submit by a fellow was removed in 1990, when you get a lot more papers being submitted that weren't then published. Now, I should say, by the way, that this system is not unique to the Royal Society. Many other learned institutions have similar systems. And most of them, like Royal Society, got rid of them in the late 20th or, in fact, early 21st century. This was an effective filtering system, but what if it filtered out too much? What if there were potentially brilliant papers by really innovative and exciting scholars who never got into the Royal Society system in the first place? That was certainly a concern. It didn't necessarily and structurally exclude women. We certainly know that women did get published, but in order to get published, you needed connections. I've just put up here the names of some of the early women who did publish with the society in one of the journals. And notice the importance of familial relationships, having a brother or a husband who could submit it on your behalf. But by the time we get to the end of the 19th century, we do start to see some academic relationships as well becoming important. And I particularly draw your attention to Alice Johnson and William Sheldon, who were both at the Balfour Biological Laboratory for Women in, developed in Cambridge. Newham College in the late 19th century, they were able to get their jointly authored paper published because an academic colleague at the university submitted it on their behalf. So it means that even if you were female, you could get into the Royal Society if you knew the right people. Notice this whole business about having to know the right people. Clearly, there's, I say, biases and restrictions in this system. And once you were in the system, uh, everything was not straightforward. Remember, I said the Royal Society insisted on the name. And this was then formalised in those printed forms I showed you earlier, where there's a space of the name of the author. And you can see that even if you have got no idea who Mrs H. Burton is, you know what gender this person is because she's Mrs. So even without knowing the identity of the author, you know their gender. And this continued right through into the 20th century, though titles were generally lost. The convention by the middle of the 20th century was that most people got initials like A.G. McClellan, whereas some people got their names like Rosalind. Franklin and other female scientists. So again, even if you didn't actually know who Rosalind Franklin was, you know what gender she was. So there are implicit biases, as I say, in this system. It's often assumed that the reason we use peer review today is to ensure that there's appropriate expert scrutiny. But I hope I've made clear that it's also a process that provides a means of excluding certain topics and perhaps certain people who don't fit into a community. And it still plays those roles today. Now, the criteria for belonging to the community have changed. We don't all have to be gentlemen, for instance, anymore. But our journal editorial processes still help to play the role in scrutinising what sort of topics, what sort of methods and what sort of people belong to the academic disciplines. It's a way of protecting the turf of any given disciplinary community and defining who gets to be a member of it. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I just want to draw your attention to the fact that, that is one of the functions that peer review performs. And it's one of the reasons it's so valuable in the academic profession, because it's part of demonstrating your credentials within a particular scholarly community. I'd also like to point out that despite the apparent continuities in refereeing, despite the fact we still have these formalised reports, the standard questions, 
we don't actually do things the same way as we did in the 1830s. Um, for instance, the Royal Society and others do not any longer work with these closed communities of referees, um, but rather with a much more open system. Um, and not all communities use um, a system where you can see the names of people when you're refereeing them. So it's, it isn't actually the same, it just looks the same on the surface. But now it's time I change and talk about the economic models used in journal publishing. So change of focus now. Um, also want to look at that history. We know that big publishing companies today are highly profitable. And again, there is an assumption here about the history of that. It's very often assumed that publishing of scientific journals is at heart a business. And this narrative also has power in the current discussions because it helps to define who the stakeholders are assumed to be in discussions about the future of scholarly publishing, whose interests should be protected. Now, it is true that when Henry Oldenburg came up with the idea of publishing back in 1865, he did indeed hope to get some money out of it. It didn't work out so well for him, unfortunately. Um, but fortunately for him, he made a good marriage and thus solved his money problems in a different way. But if we look at the case of one of his successors as editor, Hans Sloan, perhaps better known as an extremely wealthy physician and later um, important in the founding of the British Museum, Hans Sloan estimated that he'd devoted £1,500 of his own money to funding the transactions during his editorship. And depending how you do the value for money calculation, that's at least a quarter of a million pounds in today's money. The point here is that for the majority of their history, learned society journals did not make money, rather they absorbed money. They were sponsored and supported by their institutions. I mean, the Royal Society, in the, in the transactions case, that was initially in fact the editor supporting it, but from 1750 on, it's the society supporting it. And once we're into the period of society ownership, we can get actual figures on this. And you can see that the transactions did sell. You know, I'm not denying that it sold some copies. The point is it just didn't sell enough copies to cover its production costs. And the Royal Society's regular and repeated constant subsidy of its transactions was a conscious decision. It was not incompetence or unfortunate accident. When the Society took on the transactions in 1752, its council knew what it was doing. They knew that this meant there would be a charge to the Society. But and they decided to increase membership fees to try and balance out that cost. But they were willing to do so because they believed that there would be benefits accruing to the society and to its fellows from having this sort of publication. So what were those benefits that would be worth a learned institution sinking so much money into a publishing programme? Well, one of them, simply, perhaps trivially, is the fact that fellows would get free copies rather than having to purchase them. Um, so this was obviously quite a nice perk. Um, they had to collect them in person. They had to sign for them, which is what you're seeing on the left hand side. It's a signature book from 1801. And I draw your attention to this slightly schoolboyish humour of certain fellows of the Royal Society. And the final entry is from His Royal Highness, the damn bloody devil, who I don't think was actually a fellow of the Society. But the most interesting point about the use and benefit, I think, is that the Royal Society began to make gifts of the copies of the transaction initially to the King, to the British Museum, but laterally to learned institutions across Europe, to the other national academies in Paris, in St. Petersburg, in Stockholm, and so forth. This was a way of enhancing the reputation of the society and of the research sponsored by the society, of spreading the word of the Royal Society, spreading its international reputation, but also, of course, of circulating the knowledge produced under its agency. During the 19th century, this circulation increased enormously. So that we were at a stage where not just learned academies throughout Europe, but also university libraries, including all the university libraries in Britain, were getting free copies. Just think what that means. The university libraries didn't have to buy their copies. They were given them by the Royal Society. We also see government institutions in various European countries getting them. By the time we get to the early 20th century, we're looking at a global distribution pattern, although admittedly still um, veering towards the British sphere of influence. This was a non-commercial system of distribution, not based on sales, but on gifting, that enabled copies of Royal Society journals to be available in research libraries around the scholarly world in a way that was free to the end users, assuming they had access to the research institution, I know, but nonetheless free to end users, and also free to the receiving institution. It was a sort of open access for the print era, and a very different way of thinking about the circulation of research, not as a business, but as a philanthropic mission. Now, I admit, of course, there were costs involved in it, the real costs for printing and shipping all this paper around the globe. 
And they did have to be covered somehow through society funds. And also remember that the Royal Society was getting some benefits in kind. Um, historians used to call these relationships exchange relationships because I give you journals, you give me journals back. It's an exchange. My library benefits and so does yours. But actually what we've realised from looking at this is that, yes, there was some exchange, but there was actually a lot of gifting, for instance, through university libraries. Um, it would be pretty difficult to do a financial analysis of the cost benefit of this for the Royal Society, let alone for the system as a whole. But I did find that in 1954, the Royal Society attempted to do that, the first time I've ever seen them do it, and discovered they were putting a lot more money into the system than they were getting out of it in terms of stuff for the library. Um, and this, by the way, was even though they'd actually really cut back on the gifting 20 years earlier. Um, now this sort of philanthropic non-commercial model for the publication of academic research has been run and funded by the scholarly community itself, for itself. And it was grounded in collaboration between learned institutions that combined a number of different roles. They were membership organisations, they were libraries, they were also the publishers, and to a certain extent, they were funders of research as well. They were the dominant scholarly institutions of the time. Nowadays, perhaps less so, but that's what they were back then. This may seem a wonderful system, um, but I do have to admit that it wasn't ultimately sustainable as long as you're doing it on print and paper, and as long as you're aiming at a global circulation. And so it was under strain throughout the first half of the 20th century. Indeed, it was already under strain um, by the late 1890s. The problem is the costs of publication were growing and the number of places you wanted to send the journals to was growing. Um, the reason research was growing is because this is the period of the expansion of the universities. There's more people doing research at universities. There's also more government funding coming into science, particularly. And so there's more research in need of a place to publish. So the Royal, Society's public, the Royal Society's finances were already under strain by the 1890s, but it wasn't just a Royal Society problem. Here is a memorandum from the UK government written by Lord Rayleigh in 1895, when he explained to the government why scientific journals, scientific research journals specifically, couldn't possibly be profitable undertakings, even though the authors didn't get paid. The problem is that the expenses are so great, the public is so small, that they just can't be. This is why research journals in the 19th century world had to be run by learned institutions. Rayleigh's appeal to the government resulted in an annual grant in aid from the government to support learned society publishers, which continued for the next 50 years. It helped prop up this philanthropic system of distributing research. But it had to be fair, the system was still struggling. Things changed after the Second World War when we when publishing research journals ceased to be a struggle for the philanthropic model and started to become a viable commercial business. And this is what I'm working on right now, is this flipping in the system from philanthropy to commerce. The context of the Second World War is crucial to this. The entire print trade was badly hit by wartime destruction. Um, the traditional learned publishers found themselves in real economic difficulties after the war, when they had to deal with a new flood of research coming out and they were in economic difficulty. It was so bad that in the late 1950s, it seemed impossible to continue doing things the old way. And it seemed as if learned research journals without some kind of help were on the way to extinction. Which is pretty dramatic. It didn't actually happen, but it, it's how it seemed at the time. Something else was happening at the same time. And that was the emergence of new journal players, new players in the journal market, new firm, particularly Pergamon Press and its ilk. They specialised in international markets rather than national. And Robert Maxwell was very good at going and meeting uh, Soviet scientists, Chinese scientists, American scientists, working on translations between Russian and German and English, very much active in that international world of post-war, early Cold War science. That international market is significant because there's more people to buy in an international market. But it's also the fact that this business is very much about selling journals. He's not trying to give them away. And he's also trying to sell them to institutions, not individuals, which uh, means you can charge them more money, which is kind of useful. But these organisations are, of course, different from the learned institutions. Their mission is money making, not scholarship. Um, and that commitment to money was actually seen as quite brash and pushy, not just by learned societies, but actually by the traditional scholarly publishers, like the university presses, for instance, at the time. There were real concerns about how this might change the nature of academic publishing from people in the learned society side, who worried that the commercial houses had different aims in life and perhaps their high charges might become a danger. But they were at that point in time vague and unsubstantiated warnings. And the fact is that the new commercial strategy was very successful. 
and it did genuinely seem to fit with the changing nature of international scientific research in the post-war period. So learned society publishers, not unsurprisingly, felt rather threatened by these new players, um, as well as by the fact they were in economic difficulty. However, that new model that Pergamon and the Dutch publishers proposed turned out to be the route out of the difficulties, the route to avoiding extinction. This is what I'm looking at quite a lot at the moment, because the Learned Society publishers, like the Royal Society and the Royal Society of Chemistry, and ultimately the Linnaean and various other societies, survived that threat by adopting many of the same practices as the new commercial players. And so too, by the way, did the older commercial players, they also adopted this. It meant the Learned Societies utterly slashed their philanthropic distribution efforts, and they vastly increased their attention to marketing and sales, especially in North America, though also in Japan. You can see the effect of this on, learners, on Royal Society finances, where by the 1960s, they were, for the first time ever, breaking even, which is really quite a dramatic shift for their overall finances. And by the time we get to the late 20th century, the Learned Society publishers have also discovered it was even possible to make extra money from your publishing that could actually support your scholarly mission. So from this narrative, I trust it's clear that the circulation of knowledge has not always been regarded as a commercial transaction. Indeed, for most of its history, the commercial model was associated with the other, the newsier, the more miscellaneous journals, whereas the research journals were published by the learned institutions and for a range of non-financial motives. It was in the 1950s that switched, and the current push towards open access could be seen as an attempt to undo that transition, try and move back to a model in which access is free to the end user, and also perhaps to shift the balance of power away from commerce and back to scholarship. Whether it's possible or desirable to return to that model is fairly debatable. There are reasons for thinking that something could change. The funding situation is different now, the technologies are different now. But the point I want to leave you with on for this section is to say that the very fact that the commercial model of publishing is so relatively recent is a powerful demonstration that the way we do things now isn't set in stone. It has changed, it can change, it surely should change again to better fit the world that we live in. Now, the two stories I've told today offer different lessons, I think. But in both cases, I would argue that understanding the history helps us to understand why we do this, what we do. And I think also encourages us to think critically on our current practices in academic publishing. I trust it's clear that if we want to know why academics publish in the way that they do, we could look to 1665, but we could equally look to 1752 or to 1832 or you know, any number of other dates. But I'm increasingly coming to believe that the post-World War II period is the really crucial one, because that's when the formerly distinct groups of the Learned Society of Research Journals and the Commercial Science Publishing Journals, when their practices blurred and merged. I think it's really interesting that the exchange went in both directions, because the editorial systems involving referees and committees used to be about Learned Society, but then we start seeing the new commercial players using them too. And indeed, the Learned Society has also changed the way in which they use them, particularly opening up their formerly closed group of evaluators. And then we see the, pub the new publishing firms bringing in that commercial model, and the Learned Society is learning how to do that. So there's some really interesting exchanges going on there in that period in the 1950s, 60s and early 70s. And now we're pretty much at the limits of what I can tell you at the moment, because I can explain these changes to you from the perspective of the Royal Society. But whereas in the late 17th century, the philosophical transactions had been unique in the English speaking world, by, 16, six, by 1965, it was not unique. It was one journal among many. And so really disentangling the ways in which learned society publishers and commercial publishers learned from each other and thus understanding how our modern system of academic publishing emerged. And by the way, fitting that also, of course, into the bigger changes in the university sector in the second half of the 20th century and in the changes in the funding of scientific research and um, industrial R&D. That all needs a perspective that goes beyond the Royal Society. And so although, as some of you will know, I've already published a briefing paper called Untangling Academic Publishing, I'm afraid my moral from today is to say that there's still a lot more untangling needed, particularly in that post or Second World War period. I can't do, share that with you today, but I look forward to doing so at some future point. Thank you. Principal, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, and above all, dear Professor Fife. Amid this seemingly never ending gloom of face masks, social distancing, our numbers and hand sanitizers, the occasion of an inaugural lecture provides a welcome ray of sunshine. It throws light on the wonderful aspects of life, 
within an academic community, aspects that endure and continue to inspire, such as research that generates new insights and challenges ostensible certainties, the sharing of new ideas with a wide and varied group of peers, and the joy with which we celebrate the contribution of a distinguished colleague. Aileen, on behalf of your audience tonight, I would like to thank you for having sent us one of these shafts of light and for doing this so engagingly, authoritatively and thoughtfully. Your reflections on the origins and development of academic publishing over the wide sweep of three and a half centuries have elegantly combined aspects of the history of ideas, technology and institutions, of economic, gender, media and cultural history. Along the way, you have debunked a couple of widely held myths, always a favourite in the historian's trophy cabinet, and have shown us that the historical fetch of our current debates on open access to scholarly knowledge is really very long and reaches back to the very beginnings of academic publishing. For all of this, we are very grateful. You have given us academic authors much to ponder as we stare into the empty screens of our laptops yearning for intellectually acceptable ways to justify a third day of unproductive procrastination. To be honest, though, not everything you presented tonight was wholly uplifting for those of us who see academic publishing as a central task of our professional lives. The two defining features of academic publishing you mentioned are, firstly, an economic model that provides little or no financial reward to the authors, and secondly, the requirement to submit to the process of review within a group of peers, some of whom display the same inclination towards generous and constructive beneficence as a group of ferrets in a sack. But maybe we can draw solace from our collective ability as a community of scholars and academic authors to endure the agony and the ecstasy of this grim and non-lucrative process and to keep pushing onwards in the pursuit of better understanding. Moreover, and this is one of the truly uplifting aspects of your lecture, we can take joy in the fact that the group of scholars involved in this global endeavour is now much less stale, male and pale than was the case when the philosophical transaction started and for much of the 350 years that followed. I would like to end with a question that follows on from Aileen's careful exploration of academic publishing in the narrow sense. What are the lessons of her research for other forms of publishing by academics? What are the appropriate parameters that should guide us when we publicly communicate on paper or digitally with a wider audience that does not frequent research libraries and is less excited than we are about footnotes and appendices. I venture a guess that Ailing's findings would also stand us in good stead here. For a start, most academics would relatively easily come to terms with the idea of receiving royalties that actually exceed the handing fees associated with the cashing of dollar denominated checks for which these paltry sums tend to be unhelpfully sent to us now. So in terms of the economic framework, it would probably do us good to venture every now and then into a marketplace where we can show that the product of academic work is competitive and sought after. The second strand of Aileen's lecture strikes me as even more valuable here. The emphasis on scholarly independence, quality and integrity that we seek to ensure through the peer review process. Within the field of academic publishing, we can form the good scholarly habits, the ethical muscle memory that guides our fingers across the keyboard, even when we are writing for wider audiences. These pay attention to us, not in spite of our being academics, but because of it. Professor Fife, many thanks for your contribution to the School of History and to the Faculty of Arts, and for explaining to us as a historian why it is that we publish in the way we do. Thank you.